Well, thank you, Brendan, uh, for the earlier uh, very kind introduction. And I'd also like to thank the Institute of Medicine, um, and in particular, David um, and the rest of the organizing committee for giving us this privilege to engage in this discussion uh, with such an esteemed audience uh, and co-panelists. And so uh, before I start my remarks, I want to make four thematic points, which David and Brendan already covered, but I think bear repetition. The first is this concept that uh, microbes, almost all of them on our planet, exist in communities. Um, and uh, uh, spun another way, this means that anywhere we look on our planet, we find habitats uh, for microbial ecosystems. Uh, the second point is that we as humans are no exception to this particular rule, that we ourselves are hosts to this diverse, thriving ecology of microbes. Um, and uh, for, in, in many ways, we follow many of the similar rules that microbial ecosystems do in other habitats. The third is that uh, all of these habitats are connected. And the networks that connect these habitats allow microbial transmission across habitats and also microbial gene transmission across habitats. And the fourth, and the most relevant to this particular panel, is that we have no better way to perturb or destroy an ecosystem, a microbial ecosystem, than with the use of these unique, amazing molecules called antibiotics. Um, so what are antibiotics? This is a clinical audience, a largely clinical audience. So from a clinical perspective, we define them as these small molecules that have the ability to either inhibit the growth or kill pathogens. And that's the clinical realm. Um, the way they work uh, is by targeting essentially all of the most important processes uh, in the bacterial world. Uh, so for example, we heard about penicillin, and vancomycin is another class which targets the cell wall. So we break open the bug, uh, it's not going to work anymore. Um, and this extends to other bacterial processes as well, transcription, translational, uh, metabolism. And as you'll hear from, from, from those terms, these are processes that are conserved across the bacterial kingdom. And this is what leads us to this idea that antibiotics can have collateral damage. Because when we ingest an antibiotic to treat an infection, we have the opportunity, the unfortunate opportunity, to hit essentially other, uh, all of the other bacteria that that antibiotic comes into contact with. Um, and so what that has led us to, unfortunately, is for many uh, infectious diseases, uh, what is now being termed a post-antibiotic era. Um, and so just a couple numbers to emphasize this problem, most of them from the CDC in the last year. We recognize that drug-resistant infections uh, annually in the US cause uh, um, uh, millions of additional illnesses, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of deaths. Uh, this leads to a substantial burden in our society uh, uh, on the order of $35 billion of excess healthcare cost because of drug resistant infections, 8 million additional hospital days, and this is happening at exactly the wrong time. So as the rates of infectious disease try to start to climb, things like methicillin resistant Staph aureus and carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, as they are, are, are skyrocketing, sometimes exponentially, it's at the same time that our uh, pipeline for new drugs is drying up. Uh, and we'll hear from Peg about how we might uh, address that challenge. Um, with that in mind, uh, as, as Brendan mentioned, my lab is interested in interrogating antibiotic resistance uh, and the use of antibiotics using uh, sort of an ecology and evolutionary framework. But one of the first challenges we face is that almost all we know about microbiology comes from this idea of culture bias, uh, this notion that we can learn about microbiology by domesticating bugs by bringing them into our laboratory. And as we've heard before, uh, and we keep learning, especially over these last couple of decades, that ends up being a vast underrepresentation of microbes essentially anywhere. Um, and, and, and current estimates are culture bias in most microbial ecosystems gives us maybe 1% or 0.1% of what all the microbes are doing. And this, unfortunately, leads directly to a vast underestimation of the antibiotic resistance problem. And so we and others have shown that if you look at habitats like the human gut microbiota uh, or soils, most of the genes we find, the antibiotic resistance genes, uh, uh, from those culture-based studies are genes that have been described before. So you find what you uh, essentially uh, other people have found. If you look at exactly those same habitats, uh, those same samples, but now using these modern culture-independent methods uh, aided by computational biology and next-generation sequencing, the picture is entirely different. So you find large suites of antibiotic resistance genes, most of which have never been described before, but function in exactly the same way. And just to give you sort of numerical context, from dozens of, say, human fecal samples or soil samples which we've interrogated, uh, we find on the order of thousands of antibiotic resistance genes, uh, which are within the same order of magnitude of all resistance genes known in our current databases that come from medicine. Uh, so in addition to knowing that these communities out there uh, can serve as 
potential reservoirs of antibiotic resistance, we're now beginning to appreciate which specific microbes might transcend these habitat barriers to understand what is the risk associated with these resistance genes being in natural ecologies and then eventually ending up in the clinic. And so this leads me to sort of the final point that I'd like to make is to re-emphasize that antibiotic resistance, even though most of us thinking of it as a clinical problem, really has large ecological dimensions. Um, and so this is just a, a, a cartoon schematic of some of the, the players that may be at work in addition to the clinic, certainly the human microbiota. And so we and others have shown that healthy humans have encoded within them, folks who have not had antibiotics recently, signatures of resistance genes that have clearly recently exchanged with pathogens, suggesting again that this, this is crosstalk between uh, our mostly good bugs and the bugs that can cause disease. But this also extends to uh, uh, problems in agriculture. Um, as Mahdi will probably mention, you know, over 80%, and that's a conservative estimate, over 80% of the antibiotics that are used in this country are given at subtherapeutic, whatever that means, doses uh, to food animals. And you've, uh, it doesn't take much to recognize that if we're dumping antibiotics in that particular ecosystem, it's eventually going to come back to us through the food we eat. Uh, and so with the, the last minute or so that I have remaining, I want to emphasize that what we feel is necessary going forward is the design of, of, of clinical studies um, that take ecology into account. So longitudinal studies of the type that David mentioned, but which don't only look at clinical samples, but at the same time look at these interconnected ecologies, hopefully collecting samples from the families of the people who are sick and the soils that, they surround, uh, that they're surrounded with. Uh, so that we can begin to quantitatively assess this, the risk of these transmission dynamic events. Um, and uh, with that, um, I'll end my remarks and pass it on to Mari. Okay.